Watch this uppercut. Here it come. Watch the jab. Mm. This is a J Mix exclusive. Mm -hmm. You want to start this thing out, just basic introduction, let everybody know who you are and kind of what you do. Okay. Um, my name is Joe Anon. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I've, I've been the manager for uh, Moprem Shakur, the Outlaws, um, briefly, a co-manager here, just here in Europe for Moprem. Um, I've helped a lot of different artists get uh, to a certain level on, on which part they have usually moved on to a higher level of management uh, because I'm not the end game um, here in Europe. Um, uh, what do I do? Okay. Um, I'm a war veteran of Kuwait, uh, um, Desert Storm war veteran. Um, and uh, came to Germany 12 years ago and open up a nightclub called uh, Uptown Cocktail Lounge. And um, from there, uh, started Uptown Entertainment Europe and um, also started uh, Fee Movie, which is uh, short for featured music videos. Uh, from there, also started Yola Vibes Magazine. Um, and from there, also started here in Germany, the first ever JFC, Joe's Fried Chicken. <laughs> 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 which has done uh, pretty well and um, I'm pretty much uh, I'm leaving the music industry alone um, I get a lot of people hitting me up about getting their music on the radio I'm very good at doing that getting music videos on MTV uh, throughout all of Europe I'm very good at doing that but I'm out of the management game um, so and that leaves me here today with uh, Jesse now, how did you first link up with the group, The Outlaws? Um, and approximately what year was it? Um, that was uh, 2000, uh, 2009. No, I meant uh, 2000, was it 2009? Um, yeah, 2009, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> wait a second. 2006 um, was the Still Breathing Tour, wasn't it? 2006, But they did that. Yeah, they did that before. Uh, wait a minute. Um, I didn't look at my box. Okay, I think it was uh, 2008. I want to say 2008. We actually started talking to them in the winter. Um, uh, it was kind of a hit or miss thing. But in 2000, right, it was 2009. That's when we actually uh, signed a management uh, agreement, not a promoter agreement, um, an actual management agreement. Uh, whereas the group pays us, we don't pay them. Um, uh, anyone in the industry understands that. Management gets paid by the artists, not the other way around. Whereas promoters, um, booking agents actually pay the artists. Usually they pay the, the, the management and the management pays the money over to the, the artists. It can work that way. But um, in our situation with the, the outlaws, they pay us as management. Yeah, that was in 2009. We came in contact with them um, through um, Shade Scheist. Do you remember Shade Scheist? I do. Yeah, Shade Scheist, really cool dude. Um, we had actually accumulated bookings for him under a, um, a semi-management um, contract through Europe because his music is West Coast, music is very popular here, even the old school stuff. And the fact that him and Noon were doing this real comic relief thing on YouTube uh, at the time, it was very, very funny. Um, and um, they were very popular in the Seawalk community. So we were able to get them bookings relatively easy 
Um, however, that came to an abrupt end when Shade's uh, girl um, was delivering her baby, and we had to cancel the the uh, the, the uh, tour, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, I think it was Shade who actually said, "Hey, you know, uh, give Noble a call." You know, um, and at the time, uh, Shade, Noble, and TQ were doing a song with a, uh, a British company. And um, I think it's called Good Enough, the song. The, the song was a flop. It was actual, just, it was a flop. The video production was crude. It, 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 it really, in my opinion, it wasn't at, and I, I'm sorry for these guys, I don't want to, you know, um, smudge their name, uh, Red Hat or Red Music. Um, UK, uh, but it, it, it was a really bad production um, where Shade Shice, TQ, and uh, even Noble, yeah, should have done better. The three of them should have, it should have been a really good music video. Um, the song was really good. Uh, TQ's voice is impeccable as ever, and Shade just as smooth. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's how I got in touch with him um, through, uh, I think it was through, um, through Shade. Now, uh, previous to this, were you familiar with the Outlaws? Were you a fan of Tupac? Oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, I saw Tupac uh, in, in uh, the Carrollton in Washington, D.C. That's the, the, the original Outlaws back then um, at the Carrollton. I just came back from, uh, no, I just got out of the Army. Just got out of the regular Army in 1994, and he was at the Carrollton in Washington, D.C. And... Um, I said, well, you know, I'm gonna go over there and check out the show. I couldn't believe the show. I couldn't believe they had a show like that in the Carrollton. You know, <laughs> that's the thing that tripped me out. You know, this is a, a really upscale hotel, and you know, you got thug life up in here. You know, <laughs> so I, I was really, I was like, yeah, let me go check this out. Uh, but yeah, I've been a fan of uh, Tupac's. Um, I have to say, um, since I heard Britney had a baby on the radio when I heard that. That's when I became a fan of his and um, found out a lot of people had some mixtapes of, you know, with his stuff on it and started listening to stuff from there. Um, I'm a fan of Tupac's, but I'm not a historian, you know. I don't know everything about the guy or, you know, whatever, you know, conspiracy theories, um, but um, whatever the case. But yeah, Brenda had a baby. I've been a fan since then, at least, at least since 90, I think that was 93 or 94. I think it was 94. Right on. Um, so your initial hooking up with the Outlaws through uh, Shea Scheist, that you were attempting to, to manage them to set them up basically what's a, a European tour? Was that the deal that you had with them? Yeah. Uh, well, when we say with them, okay, the only, pers only person I was talking to at the time was uh, Rufus, Rufus Cooper, Young Noble, AKA Young Noble. And he presented himself as the, the go-to guy for the group and he made all of the decisions. And um, our deal was, okay, are they interested uh, of doing a tour? And under what conditions are they interested in doing a tour? And uh, Noble brought it to us as if they, they, they had an abundance of, um, of projects that needed to be handled under one umbrella. So um, we decided that a management contract for five years would, would cover that. Um, they had been in Germany for, I think, three years up to that point. Um, yeah, 2006, um, they had been here and that didn't go well. So, yeah. I kind of I wanted to cover myself. Um, that's why I assisted on a management contract. <laughs> so they had a problem booking shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. From everything that I've heard and and some stuff I've heard from you, um, how big a, how big of a problem did they have booking shows? I a lot of people believe, as well as I do, that their core audience is in Europe. Um, you would think that they would have invites just pouring out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your difficulties booking um, the Outlaws? 
Well, uh, here's the problem that they have, and they still have to this day, is you had fans wanting to book them. You know, somebody that wasn't a legitimate promoter, wasn't a legitimate booking guy, wasn't a legitimate management, just weren't legitimate in the industry. And they had no idea what the industry, what are the ins and outs of um, booking shows. Um, so they, they had fans trying to book them. And um, you may have a, let's say in, in, uh, in Stuttgart, um, you may have, um, I don't know how many people in Stuttgart, God, there's a couple of million, but I, I, in a small area in Stuttgart, you may have, let's say, uh, 500,000 people, like the size of D.C., you know, um, and you got a group of guys say, you know, let's book the Outlaws, man, with, you know, the Tupac fans, and they're really gung-ho, but it's really just them and maybe 20 other dudes that want to pay 20 euro to see these guys. So that, that you, you, you can't book a tour on 50 people in each city wanting to see these guys. So um, what we had to turn around and do is we had to, no one in Germany wanted to book them. And I'm talking about 70 different locations throughout the country that does hip hop. Okay, 70 different locations. Germany's small. You can fit Germany and Texas like four times. So Germany's small. Yeah, it's a small country. Got eight. Now we have about 83 million people. That's only because of the 3 million refugees that came in <laughs> over the last couple of years. But 80, let's say 80 million people. How many of them you think are hip hop um, uh, fans? And then you got to break it down as how many of them are hip hop fans that could pay to get into the club? And then you say, how many of them are hip hop fans that listen to old school rap that's at least 15, 20 years old? So you break down all these demographics and financials and you realize outlaws are not on the top 50 groups. They're not in that top 50. They're not even in the top 50 with MOP. You know, they did some um, music with Stickman and they did some music with Dead President. And that was just keeping them afloat, you know, as far as the underground music scene. Um, so, yeah, it was just really hard when you break everything down into numbers, you know. And um, at the end of the day, that's what it is for anybody's work or life is numbers, money and just wasn't adding up. So we had to book uh, five shows in Germany um, under the outlaws. As their management, Ruth, uh, Noble said, well, just book a couple of places, man, you know, sell the tickets and, you know, let's see what happens. And so sure enough, other people wanted to start booking them outside of Germany because they saw these other bookings. Right. Not knowing that we were the ones that rented these venues. <laughs> Do you see? So it wasn't other people. It was a facade. It wasn't other people trying to book them. They were, you know, on a wing and a prayer. And Noble knew this. He, he this dude schooled me, man. He schooled me. I have to say that. So I, <laughs> I got a little bit more knowledge of the industry and how um, desperate people uh, who have drug problems do desperate things. Because once they once they bounce, who's going to ask for the money from the um, these other venues? When you don't have enough money to pay the door security, you don't have money to pay the lights guy, the the, the sound guy, you know, the actual venue, and you don't put all this money into everything else. But then they don't show up for the gig or say, "I want uh, that." Uptown's not managing me anymore, so. They don't show up for the gig, but well, you got to still pay those tickets back and you still got to pay all those other fees from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000 euro back to the venue. And who's going to get caught? The management. We are here. Our address is here. They go back to the United States. So and his name's not on, you know, 
uh, is not on this on the contract. It's the management's name on the contract. So I ended up having to pay back over thirty five thousand euro worth of no shows. So that's a, that's about fifty thousand dollars U.S. Correct. At that time, it was actually more. <laughs> At that time, it was damn near seventy thousand dollars. It was close to seventy thousand dollars, man. So, so you line up four or five. Uh, you said five shows, and this starts. Well, in general, let's see, we had uh, Hanover, Stuttgart, um, uh, Hamburg, um, Berlin, Frankfurt. Yep, yeah, five. Yeah. And this this gets them somewhat of a buzz to where other venues want to start booking them. Right, because they see they think that there's an interest for them, not knowing that. We book these venues ourselves. We are renting these venues ourselves on behalf of our artists who we are managing. And we're selling these tickets online, you know, through Ticketmasters. And all in all, out of five venues, we sold out that. This is off the top of my head, but it was less than 90. I think it was like 86 or 76 tickets. Total. <laughs> Total, wow. total. I have to look at my box, but it was either 86 or 76 total tickets online that we sold to Ticketmasters uh, for five venues. And um, man, I'm talking about, I don't know what's the most popular station, hip hop station and in um, and where you are, but in Berlin, for example, it's Jam FM. Jam FM for four months was advertising this every other day. Every other day. Um, Stuttgart at Big FM every other day for four months. Hamburg, same thing at Kiss FM in Frankfurt um, at uh, 9306 or 9603 or whatever it is. And, and, and um, Hanover, I mean, everybody was advertising this, you know, we have posters up everywhere. I mean, it was, we had them in magazines. Everybody thought these guys were dead. They really thought that they were dead. I mean, totally dead. I was like, like not living, <laughs> you know, um, and we brought these characters back to life. We even got a live stream for the concerts through a uh, music video channel, which was super hot back then, called Ya Video. And um, we had them on all our tickets and everything. And they did this huge thing. Anybody listening to hip hop music was watching TV, looking at Ya Video music on TV. They're all the, the latest hip hop, black music, blah, 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 right? And that's what they call hip hop here, black music. Um, and uh, even on the TV, that's the term they use. And uh, they saw, oh man, the outlaws, okay. Uh, these other groups had to do a competition of who was gonna be the pre-acts and everything. I mean, it was, we made a huge production of this. So when Noble says they didn't do this and they didn't do that, they didn't, man, he's so, he's so full of shit, it's unbelievable. Can you believe that? I mean, how many, you got them on, on the number one hip hop television show. You know, um, uh, what was her name in Italy? Italy, Italy. Um, um, Fendi. Fendi is like <laughs> it's like Gucci here in Europe. Okay, and Coolio's nephew, Gangsta Lou or G Lou, he booked them in Rome, and he got um, Federica. Federica Fendi, who is the heiress, she's like Paris Hilton of Italy, to book them in Rome. 80 people showed up. Wow. Now To that... a private party. To a, meet up a private party of this woman. She was so upset. <laughs> she was scared of Noble. I'm not bullshitting you. She was scared of this guy. She called us up and she said, Joe, Melanie, please, please, in her Italian accent, um, please, 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 I send a private jet, please come and, and please be here with me. I, I don't like the way this man looks at me. 
I don't like it. She got extra security because Noble looked at her so dirty. So, you know, you know, taking her clothes off sort of thing. And that's what she was saying. You know, she was so offended. She didn't even go to the show. Gangsta Lou had to go there by himself. That's the kind of character we're talking about. Uh, he's a predator um, as well as a, a junkie. Well, so. let's talk about that a little bit. What now? When you say he's a junkie, some some of the fans out there they're going to be, you know, upset that you say that. But what kind of uh, demeanor? What kind of attitude were you dealing with? Um, and what kind of what kind of drugs were going on? Um, anything from weed to crack. Um, to heroin and, and, and regular coke. And, and of course, you know, hint, lots and lots of Hennessy. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, he, you deal with somebody. Here, okay. Uh, two hours before they was getting on the plane, uh, and I already provided this with uh, the 313 Live with uh, Mr. Foster, proof showed him proof, gave him the documents. Because for all these years, I kept these documents. I didn't say anything. I just let Noble trash talk me and my wife and my company. And um, I decided it was enough. It was a chapter in my life I had to close. I wanted to prove, show that this dude is a liar. Okay, he's a, and he's a drug addict. Um, and uh, well, two hours before he was supposed to get on the plane, this dude, you remember, it's like six in the morning, my time, you know, telling me, if you don't send me more money, we not getting on the plane. You know, so I ended up having to send him another 750 euro before eight o'clock in the morning so they can get on the damn plane in Atlanta. After I had already sent him 1,500, no, two, no 1,250. Because he said he needed to take care of some financials, you know, before they, you know, to prove that we are doing whatever we say we're doing. Which he knew. I was sending the guy faxes and emails with all the numbers, what's going on. You know, everything is transparent. And um, yeah, I, I had no choice but to send him that money because we were fully committed to the shows. We were fully committed to the the guys in um, Slovenia, the guys in Denmark, the guys in um, Sweden, the guys in Italy. Uh, we were fully committed to these guys because they had already paid their deposits. And we used that money to buy the tickets, <laughs> you know, um, uh, for them. We used that money for, for flights, um, God. For the venues, you know, it was a little bit of it for the venues, but all of the marketing money, it came out of our pocket. We figured we were going to get that back in, you know. And if we, and if we broke even at the end of the first tour, fine. We were going to blast the second tour. So for us, it was a, a long-term commitment, you know. Now, when you when you first met them, uh, your, your agreement was with uh, Rufus Cooper, who's noble. Um, that was your agreement the whole time, but yeah. what did that entail? What to you? What group were you getting? Who were you getting out of that deal? Well, actually, in the beginning, um, he said that Castro was coming. He sent me um, uh, because we, in order for us to book the flights from here, because it was just no something told me, no, 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 don't send him the money and tell him to book the flights. So from here to book a flight for an American coming into Germany, I had to, the, 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 the travel agency, they needed to see the passports for themselves. So I had uh, Rufus, Young Noble, send me copies of the passports for everybody that was coming. So he sent me his passport, Stormy's passport, Edie's passport, Castro's passport, and um, uh, what's the, the the video dude's name? Um, heavy set white dude. Um, then anyway, dude is a video guy. Turns out he's also a rapper. He got a song with Snoop Dogg too now. Um, um, De, uh, James Wade, that's his name. James Wade. So Castro was part of the first. He was part of the ticket. 
It was supposed to be Young Noble, Stormy, EDI, and Castro performing live, you know. Tupac still breathing tour, you know. <laughs> and um, a, a day before they were supposed to fly, Noble says that Castro can't come because he's locked in on papers in New Orleans for child support. So they're holding his passport now. Now, t t tell us a little bit about the Tupac Still Breathing Tour. Why was it called that? It was already good. There was before that, it was called um, um, Tupac, and the Outlaw, Tupac and the Outlaw Still Breathing Tour. And then it was also called Tupac with the Outlaws Still Breathing. So you had and, Tupac and, and Tupac with. Okay, so... Um, that didn't sit well with us, with me and uh, Melanie. Melanie said, no, I don't like this, Joe. I don't like this at all. Um, and I said, well, I don't like it either, baby. You know, this, 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 you know, because there's some strange rules here in Germany. You know, they don't they don't play this. You know, you know, you can play with words. You know, um, because it gives the idea that the man is maybe he'll pop up. Maybe he's still alive. Really, you know. Um, they, they don't play that kind of thing. You can get lawsuits so quick. I mean, um, so we were talking to Noble. Noble was like, no, no, that's the way it is. You know, that's what people know it is as blah, blah, blah. And so uh, we decided, okay, let's brainstorm this a little bit because this isn't going to work for us. So, so, you know, why not just call it Tupac Still Breathing instead of Tupac and the Outlaws, Tupac with the Outlaws. Just call it Tupac Still Breathing to us as a, as a as a metaphor, okay, that his music is still going. Let's just break it down that way. All right, all right, I could do that. Anyway, so he agreed to go with it that way. But then he goes on, once we have this big problem in Berlin, he goes on a radio station, no, radio, TV station. Um, it was one of these bootleg, you know, hip-hop video dudes, somebody, YouTuber. Uh, he says that we came up with that whole idea. We didn't even know this dude in 2006 when he came up with that crap. And he screwed over the dude in Australia. He screwed over that dude in Australia so bad. So some other dude picked him up and helped him with the rest of the tour. And then he did it in 2006. He screwed over that guy who was, a, who was again, who was a a, um, a, uh, a fan who got these bookings set up. He screwed over that young man. And then Tobias Herner from THI Entertainment, Tobias picked him up. Now, Tobias is a real cool dude. And this is, what, this is the only reason that Noble was able to walk freely in Germany over the the, the, the last uh, six months that he was here off and on doing this Tupac um, thing with the movie. The only reason why he was able to, and, and Noble knows that. He knows that I care about Tobias. He knows that Tobias is a friend of mine and I would never take food off Tobias's table. You understand? And so he decided to get with Tobias to have Tobias take him from place to place and you know, um, do these uh, video things and whatever, uh, promoting the movie. Um, because had he not used Tobias, I was going to go to Noble's ass. For those that don't know the history, can you tell us exactly what it is? I mean, what the fallout was between you and Noble? Okay. The fallout, um, it started again, two hours before he got on the plane, telling me that he needed more money. So he was strong arming me there. When we got them from the airport, because see now I done sent them 750 euro. Um, and I told you we didn't have much money to begin with. We done spent over $3,000 or 3,000 euro flying them to the United States, round trip tickets, flying them here to Germany. Now he's asking me to send him, uh, I sent him another 1250 so you start doing the math. We're talking about over 4,000 euro here. And we, we got less than 100 people already don't pay tickets. Less than 100, you know. Um, and then... At this point, uh, are you already operating in a net loss? Yeah, already. I mean, straight from, from Jump Street, it's, it's a loss. 
But like I said, if we break even, no worries. Even if we fall a little bit short, a couple thousand, no worries. You know, we can make that up on the second tour, you know, because I'm thinking long term. So when we, when we get up to Hamburg, we get to Hamburg about six or something in the morning. And they get there, I think, at eight something. He doesn't even say, what's up, Joe? Hey, Melanie, you know, we appreciate everything you guys are doing. He don't say nothing like that. He asked me where the fucking weed is at. That's the first fucking thing this dick asked me for, you know. Um, then instead of us having to fly, being able to fly from Hamburg to Stuttgart, I got to drive these fucking bums, all right? I'm not going to call Stormy a bum. I'm not going to call that dude a bum. That dude can rap. He's a legitimate dude. I really appreciate that dude, Stormy. But Edie and Noble are fucking bums. They're two bums. Um, so I got to drive these bums from Hamburg all the way down to Stuttgart, which is like damn near seven hours, uh, instead of flying them because I had to send this fool money, uh, 750 euro. And now we got to stay in a, th uh, a three-star hotel instead of a four-star hotel. It's a really nice hotel, actually. Um, it's very private. It's very, very nice. Um, but e Noble talks about that, and so did Edie. When we're walking through the city, and there's one fucking dude out of, like, millions of fucking people walking around. Millions of people. I'm talking about, you know, you're at the, at the major train station, the biggest shopping center area. You got the big old... You know, the giant Mercedes Benz sign out there, you know, because that's where the factory is. It's huge. You got you got money, lots of money, you know, retail, you know, commerce going on. And one dude comes up and he says, hey, man, and he comes to me because I'm the white guy. So he comes to me and he says, hey, man, you know, in Germany, are these the outlaws? I said, yeah, man. And I was like, whoa, great. Millions of people one guy comes and he, he says can I get a picture it's not for me you know it's for my brother my little brother he's a fan you know a big Tupac fan it's a Moroccan dude and uh, either Moroccan or Lebanese so I go over to Noble because you have to ask those questions here in Germany because you're not allowed to just take pictures of people without their permission really that's yeah. a, it's a it's a crime right you can't just go it's crime it, that's why you don't have paparazzi here okay no paparazzi running around chasing on people. So it's a law. So he, this young man was ab uh, abiding by the law. <laughs> and so I go to Noble because I'm trying to buy this bumpy neck, okay, um, some clippers so he can shave his bumpy ass neck, okay, with my money, not his, mine. And <laughs> so the guy, I'm just sorry, just thinking back at this day, man, how crazy it was so the guy says uh, I, I asked Noble Noble says yeah tell the dude you got to give me um, you know uh, 60 grams I said what you know, I'm talking about what, 60 grams you know it's weed man I said you honestly he said look man more, more, more picture or not man so I said alright right. You know, so I thought the dude was going to say, you know, fake out and kiss my ass. But no, the dude doesn't say that. So the dude was like, bet, you know. Um, so we're going to party together? I said, well, not with me. I don't do that shit, man. You, you know, you guys can do what you want. And I tell him the hotel, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, when he did that and I saw him scrunched over, you know, filming up that damn crack and shit, and, you know, lacing up that way, you know. It was a lot of things that led him to the moment that happened in Berlin. So anyway, then the way he treated the, we get to the to the venue later on that day to do sound check. But real and quick, I, actually, I, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I don't want <laughs> people to lose. Um, and definitely check out Rel's show on 313. But the story goes, the guy the guy shows up with some some marijuana and first, uh, first, first. And uh, he he comes back with uh, I guess Noble asked him for something harder. It was some crap. And you found Noble in his in his hotel room. Just well, the dude showed it to me because I so I said, man, show me what the fuck you got in your hand. So he goes in his pocket and shows me a couple of vials of crack. 
He was, I was like, well, whatever, you know. You know, like DMX said, I ain't got nothing against a dude to, you know, what he got to do to get by if he got to get high, you know. <laughs> so, hey, do your thing, whatever. But I go into the room with Edie um, and uh, Stormy, and I'm talking with them for a little bit, and I come back out, and I'm, just, I'm thinking, I got to go check on this dude, you know. So I go in there, and he slumped over, man, you know, hitting that, man, he hit that, shit. it was like a, a blue flame just shot out that damn joint, man. He was like, Whoosh. It was like, and he was just like, I mean, he was at warp speed. Wherever he went, he went at warp speed. You know, <laughs> Scotty killed the fuck out his ass. <laughs> I'm telling you. And I was like, damn. Now, just, just so everybody realizes, this was the one fan that they had. And uh, they had him bring this stuff. And this was all for a picture. This was all just so the fan could take a picture with the guys, right? One picture. He wasn't even a fan. It was his br little brother. He wanted to take the picture for his little brother. Yeah. Um, and they bought these, he had bought these goony goo goo looking <laughs> ugly ass African chicks up in there, man. These bitches were ugly as fuck. I still can't get over that, man. It was the. <laughs> now, these are Dang. prostitutes, right? No. I don't know if they're prostitutes or they groupie bitches or, or or I don't know what they were. I never even actually had a word with these women, you know, but they were nasty. That's all I could tell you. They was greasy. They were nasty. Um, they was busted, man. They was. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, man. You know, uh, if you're going to mess around in your old lady, she need to be like, she need to be like, pow, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they look like some alley walls, man. They was, they was nasty. Well, anyway, <laughs> they even took them back to the backstage with them, man, you know, during the show. Like, you know, look at my bitches. I got these bitches, you know. <laughs> you know, man, they look like skeet marks. Boy, they were nasty. <laughs> so I, I, I did interrupt you. You were talking about what happened in Berlin, I believe. You were going to... Oh. Well, once we, okay, yeah, once we got from Berlin, like, well, again, that show in Stuttgart and how they treated that young man that had all these tattoos, these Tupac tattoos, can, can uh, he came down, that, please? that happened in Berlin, this guy came down, he drove down from Berlin, because he wanted to see them first, even though he knew that we were going to be in Berlin the very next day. He wanted. He said, I have to see him now. I wanted to see him when I first got here. I'm so thankful, you know, I'm here, you know. Kid was 18 years old. He was so proud. He was so happy. And, and Noble didn't want him to take the picture um, um, showing his thug life tattoo because he was like, we the outlaws and, you know, um, thug life, we the outlaws. <laughs> I mean, it hurt, it hurt this kid so bad. He was really a light-skinned white boy, you know, authentic European white. I mean, like, <laughs> and his face just got so red, you know. So and no refused to take the picture with him because he had a photo. Yeah, like after him. he saw, because there was a mirror behind me, after he saw, because the dude lifted up his shirt, he's standing there like, with Noble and Edie, like, what? You know, and he flipped up his shirt. He's got thug life. He's so happy and shit. No, look, this is a man, f that, man. What the f you doing, man? Man, we, we want to the outlaws, man. We ain't thug life, man. Fuck it, fuck out of here with that shit. That boy, man, he had tears in his eyes, man. I went on and took the picture with his shirt down. He had tears in his eyes, man. I, that, that, was a, that was some hurtful shit to do to that fan. I mean, that young man was, he was hurt. That was almost, I think it was almost like if I could have put myself there, finding out that this ain't your daddy <laughs> for the last 18 years. This really ain't your daddy. And you love this man, you know. That's how hurt this kid looked, man. I mean, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that shit. But it happened. So the next day, um, we didn't make enough money to actually get on a plane to even charter flights, okay? Because then I done drove them down. 
done spent all his money. I mean, on, t- on two tickets that I didn't need. James Wade, we didn't need James Wade. He's not a performer. And Castro didn't come, even though we bought tickets for him. We couldn't uh, refund him because he didn't tell me until the day before. Um, round trip. So anyway, um, I had to uh, get the, uh, the Thug Life guys to book the flight to get to Berlin. And they booked the flight. We went up there. Um, the place hold, I think, it was, I think it was like 700 people. I told Noble it was too much. I told him, I said, there's an NBA, not an NBA game, but um, a German, um, it's like the German version of the NBA finals right down the street. I said, it's not, it's not a good look. This place is too big. He wanted it. He demanded it. Um, so we booked it. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was like, at that show, I think it was like 67, 65 people came in there, including the live stream from your video. Jam FM was there doing interviews. We had uh, four pre who went through this five or six months of uh, competition on this major television network to perform there. And you had 60 something people in the audience. Plus a whole 700. So the place was empty. And we had um, got a, uh, a sponsorship from Thug Life Clothing, who said that they had legitimate rights to Thug Life brand. Well, they don't, <laughs> but it's not my fault. <laughs> so you, you book the five shows, you guys go, and it just kind of falls apart. You're, you're not getting the audience. Um, at what point was, was the friction? At what point did you guys just have oh. the out-and-out out disagreement? Yo, it was two times I was ready to f*** this dude up. The first time was in Stuttgart. Doing after, just before the sound check, no, after the sound check, um, I parked the van. I wasn't familiar with the area. The van got locked into a parking lot. So I had to call and you know, make some arrangements. And, you know, it took a half an hour out of our time. Noble gets in my face. He's like, you stupid mother, blah, blah, blah. And this is the same dude that was smoking this shit earlier, right? Um, and he's in my face. So I turned around to my wife and I asked my wife, you know, baby, go over this stand over there for a quick second. I look in, I, I stand right here in this dude's face. I said, you raise your voice one more time to me, ever. I'm going to fuck you up. What, what would you go do? I said, I'm going to fuck you up. Do we have an understanding? I said, don't get this suit all twisted. Don't get it twisted, man. All right, look, man, just handle your business, man. Anyway, got the van out of the parking lot and moved on. So now, at the end of the show in Berlin, the five songs they did, we're at the, now we got to make arrangements to pay the lights guy, the sound guy, the door security. Above everybody, you got to pay door security because most of the door security are Hell's Angels. And if you don't pay them, you may not leave the city. Unless you run through that, slam on the gas and get the out of Dodge. That's the only way you're going to get the away from the Hells Angels. You better be quick and slick with it. Okay. Because the Hells Angels don't play when it comes to door security money. That's how they, one of the ways they earn their living. So anyway, we pay these because I'm trying to leave the city. <laughs> so, um, it's about 11 o'clock at night. I'm in the room. My wife and I, we, you know, we we going through it, you know, about how we're going to handle the rest of the, the shows and whatnot. And um, I'm taking more money out, out of my private account, you know, and um, stateside transferring to this night. And the phone keeps ringing. And I finally, I answered this noble. He's acting a fool on the phone. We need to talk. We need to talk. I'm not talking to somebody who's drunk or high. Right. 
So I tell him, I talk to you in the morning, man, at breakfast, like nine o'clock or whatever. He all night long, he's ringing my phone. So about six thirty in the morning, to six six thirty in the morning, I'm getting this banging at my door. I jump up and my boxes. I open the door. It's noble, and I just crash this dude. I just, I just I open the door. I see this young man. I just crash this dude into the hall, through the hallway, up against the the, the wall. Um, the wall stopped up. Um, here comes Edie and Stormy out of the room and James Wade. And I said, I'm going to kill you. I told you I don't fuck with me. I told you. My wife, she's screaming. And he's like, get off me, get off me, get off me. I said, you druggy, you I'm, I'm saying all kinds of shit. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to hit the guy because the dude don't know me. He, he really, he got me twisted. He, he <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I'm not an action figure. I'm not the baddest dude on the planet, but um, he went too far. So anyway, um, Edie comes over and he puts his hand on my left shoulder and he's like, look, man, calm yourself down. I got this dude by his bumpy ass throat. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to snap his fucking larynx. I'm ready to hurt, really hurt the guy bad. And my wife, she's screaming at me. I let him go. And I said, look, we'll meet downstairs at nine o'clock. <laughs> and we talk. I mean, I'm, I'm so angry. Um, so anyway, we get downstairs and he's telling me, uh, yeah, I want a, um, I want all the contacts for everybody. You're no longer managing us, blah, blah, blah. And I, uh, I said, we got a contract. So no matter what you do from this point forward, okay, no matter what, we are your managers. You can say whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, but we have upheld our portion of this contract five years. Okay, we've upheld this for this part and it's gonna go five years. At the end of the contract, which it says at the end, you got to send me a letter saying it's not going to be renewed automatically. Okay. <laughs> you know, breaking it down to him like he's a you know kindergartner. Um, meanwhile, I'm enjoying my my um, eggs Benedict and my cantaloupe and my cup of coffee. And <laughs> he's still acting a fool. And I told him, I'm not giving you shit. All right, you're gonna uh, do this music video that you have to do over the next two days. Um, and um, you're going to go fly down to uh, Italy and the tickets have already been paid for, all right? Because this is part of the contract. They had to pay for the day, um, the day before, the day of, and the day after. So three days. That's the way I had them set up for their other bookings as far as hotels. So everything was being lapsed over and taken care of. So they would have as little money out of their pocket as possible. And um, that's the way I left it because these people um, uh, trusted me and trusted my wife Melanie uh, to be professionals and to make sure everything that was handled uh, properly. And so that's what we were going to do. And I wasn't going to let this dude, no matter what his mouth was saying, screw that up. And um, um, I said, you don't need us here. Thug Life is going to handle the, the next couple of days. So you don't need us here. Uh, I think it's best that I roll out before I put my hands on you in a worse way, man. And he was like, all right, man, whatever, whatever. Meanwhile, there's no Edie. There's none of them are there. He's making all these decisions on his own. And But this is exactly what he did in 2006 in Australia. Exactly what he did in Germany in 2006 as well with those managers you know he hustled people, he hustled people to get the shows and then he wanted to come in and make bring in all the money for himself and not um take care of the guys that got him there you know what is the uh, dynamic like between noble and Edie? their relationship uh, Edie is quiet man that dude he's quiet as a church mouse you know he get on stage and he goes through the motions through the routine uh, he smoke his weed. Um, 
as you could as you can tell, he's he's high as fuck in most of the interviews that if you see him here in Germany in Europe, he's high as fuck because that's that's what they do. They give him some weed, they give him high. Noble's not high during the interview. He's getting fucked up afterwards. You know, he's one of those um, the, those functional addicts. You know, you know, lock myself in a dark room and get fucked up and blue flame that shit up. You know, that's he's one of those kind of addicts. You know, Edie, he wants he smokes his weed and you know everybody's comfortable with it. The video dude, he's smoking weed. Everybody's smoking weed, but they're used to smoking this kind of weed here. Because the weed here in Europe is a lot, it's like 60% stronger here than it is in America. So, wow. so, so when you see Edie, like, I was stuck, man. I forgot what I was going to say. Because the weed is so strong. But the dynamic is, um, Noble's running the show. Edie's alone for the ride. He goes through the motions, you know, is, 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 is painting by colors, you know, um, or by the numbers, if you will, and that's that's his life when he comes here primarily. Now, I'm not trying to bite off rail, but you started to tell a story on there about asking Edie because he was in the car behind Pac when he was shot. Mm -hmm. Did he ever answer you? No, no, he didn't. He never answered me because um, this is one of those few times that you can actually get this guy alone without um, without Noble interjecting. And the guy interjects at every opportunity that he can. And um, uh, I think, again, Edie's a very laid back dude, but he got something on his heart, man. You could tell. You know, if you ever been to war, I'm gonna say if you ever been to war or been to jail, okay? I know, I know you've been behind the motherfucker still. Okay, you've been back there. Um, either the person has been to war or they've been to jail. You can tell when somebody got something heavy on their heart and they trying their best not to let it out. Because it's either it's going to get them in some trouble or it's going to make them look weak. Okay. And I think that Edie got both of those things. But I think right now, knowing that the outlaw's money is going to get cut in about seven or eight months um, from the family, he's trying to do whatever he got to do. He's got to, he's got to, he's got to find that courage some way to do, you know, some of these documentaries, doing this stuff on, on, uh, with uh, Ice T. Um, you know, he's got to find that courage to talk about that situation and to stumble all over it, to, to make up lies. He can't even remember what it is. He do so t terribly nervous. Because he has something to either, he's either hiding something that he knows he's going to get in trouble for, okay, or he's hiding it because he feels ashamed of something. And I think he feels either ashamed or he's hiding both, one of the two, as far as Tupac's death is concerned. Um, because he was there. <laughs> he was there. Nobody was arrested, you know, as far as that night was concerned. Somebody should have been arrested that night. Period. Okay. So, um, and he, he, him changing his stories, you know, here and there. Um, him, uh, Noble always interjecting. I think Noble got some ish on them. He got some ish on, on, he got to have something on, on Edie. He got to have something on him, baby. <laughs> You're a grown ass man. You got another grown ass man always interrupting you. Yeah, that's odd. Oh, this, Seeing as Noble was one of the last outlaws brought on board, it was it was literally we don't even about know if he was brought days. on board. We don't know if he was brought on board. Who the fuck knows that for real? Did Tupac ever say young Noble? He, he, he no, he never introduced this dude, and that is why a lot of people here in Germany didn't want to book him too, because they was like, who's this dude? He's not one of the original outlaws. You know, he's not part of this. You know, who is this guy? And he burned a lot of bridges before he even got across it, before he even got an opportunity. Because they're like, who is this guy? We we don't know that Tupac ever uh, endorsed this guy. We don't know that. Where does it show that at? Because he was on stage with him one time? 
in the background. That's a damn good point. Us. You're making a damn good point. He used one or two songs that the dude possibly wrote himself or, or has some sort of, um, you know, input in. We don't know. He never mentioned him in any way, shape, or form. Not no home videos. Not no, what is he? How many pictures are out there? Maybe one or two ever? Okay. Yeah, so there's, we don't there's, know there's a couple ever rare in the Huh? I, there's a couple rare pictures, but yeah, there's, yeah, like you said, there's one or two. Man, you know, again, I'm not a, a Tupac fanatic, but if you want to look at someone's legitimacy, because, see, you got the outlaws are what you would call a, um, a legacy uh, legend group. The, 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 Part of a legend of Tupac, and, a, and they're supposed to be a legacy group from this man, right? But they turned out to be crumbs and bums and addicts, okay? That's what they turned out to be, all right? Um, and I think it was all stirred with, um, with, uh, with Noble for, for whatever reason. I don't know how this guy was able to manipulate um, Afeni. Either, but she realized it too that he was manipulating her at the end too. Um, but how he was able to to do it, just like when I asked, I asked him at the beginning before we booked all his shows, can we get Mo Crane and Big Psych and Macadocious on this, right? Can we get these other three guys on this? No, nah, man. They said I'm gonna talk. He called me back a couple of days later um, or emailed me, and I called him. Um, no, nah, man. Um, Edie, no, uh, Mo Crane, you know. You can't afford him, and Big Psych ain't trying to get with it, and you know Macadosis ain't doing shit. Big Psych ain't in it. So when Mo Prem contacted me after all the shit hit the fan with the Outlaws, with Noble and Noble writing all this bullshit about me and my company, um, Mo Prem sent me an email, and I'm thinking, oh shit, we got a problem. <laughs> I hope that he don't think that we're trying to hurt the name of the Shakur family or the Shakur Foundation, um, which we weren't. We were just telling the truth about this one dude who, as far as we are concerned, are, is representing Tupac. All right? He's the guy who's representing him. He's the one who's selling Tupac's gear. He's the one selling Tupac verses um, to, to no-name rappers throughout Europe. Okay? Just like he did to Echo Fresh. He sold a Tupac verse to Echo Fresh called uh, Bad Boys. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, look on, look, look on YouTube. It's called Bad Boys, and then you put an Echo Fresh, E uh, E K O, and then Fresh. No, I and actually, I know the track. I just didn't know that Noble was the one that sold it to him. He sold it to Echo Fresh. Everything. Because, see, Noble um, did a song with Echo Fresh where Echo Fresh had his first. Uh, solo album because dude could write good music. Echo Fresh, he's a really good writer. Um, his rap music is okay. He uh, he's come a long way in the last two, uh, fifteen years or whatever. Um, and he's a totally different kind of representative of music today. Um, he's, he's really a very positive influence on a lot of people today. Now, when Outlaws did a song with this dude, God, I don't remember how damn long ago that was. It was a few years, but. What I wanted to mention is what I would have 2006, to 2005. Once you put a challenge out there, won't anybody that uh, is out there that is listening to that interview mm -hmm. produce a picture with Noble and Tupac? Yeah. Well, uh, Melanie just said put a challenge out there for anyone uh, other than these two rare pictures. Put a challenge out there for anyone to produce a picture and or audio of Tupac endorsing Young Noble. Where now I'll do that. I will yeah, do that. Yeah, Let her know I'll well, do that. We don't know. We don't know if this guy endorsed him. We don't know. All we know is the night that Tupac was killed, this dude said that he was back at the mansion. Now you're 18 years old now. Why aren't you out there with them? Did you know something was going on? Why are you controlling EDI, who is the only eyewitness of the shooter? Yeah, you asked some questions. Do you think that they care about Tupac's legacy? I don't think they give a fuck about Tupac's legacy. 
The only person I know for sure, 100 percent, is Mo Prime. I know 110 percent that this dude is not going to go out there riding on his brother's blood. All right. Because Mo Prime was already a, a um, I won't say he was a superstar, but he was already in the business for years before Tupac got in. All right. So like when he, uh, I think the one song we did with Tony, Tony, Tone, that was one of his footnote projects. That was one of his footnote projects. He was called Mercedes back then. The footnotes uh, project, but it got him in the industry. And he started doing a lot of writing and a lot of other different things, producing. And the guy was all over the place now. And that was a threat to Suge Knight having uh, Mo Prime there. That was a, a big threat to him. Now, no, they don't care about the legacy. If they cared about the legacy, they would have let somebody manage them that had management skills instead of trying to do it all themselves. They wouldn't have fucked each other over what Nova wouldn't have fucked over uh, Castro for I don't know how many thousands of dollars. How many tens of thousands that they fucking over um, Fatal's family right now, okay? Do, you know, no, they don't care. And again, it's being ran by a guy and the fans, you guys can say whatever you want to say, you know, I'm going to love you at the end of the day because you're a person, you're a man, you're a woman, okay? You're a living, breathing person and you're compassionate, you know, about this man and his music, okay? Even though I didn't know the guy personally, but I, I can't rap, I can't sing. <laughs> I could barely play the violin or any damn thing other any, um, any other interest, instrument so I got the utmost respect for for people who have talent um, and is willing to share that with the world so having said that they cannot possibly have respect for this man and again it's being ran by a person who we don't even know was actually officially endorsed by Tupac How many days were did they come and they were in Europe? Did it take uh, for you to fall out with them? <laughs> a day and a half, two days, man, two days, and it happened. It happened. This was planned because it happened the same way in Australia in 2006, the same way in Germany in 2006, and again in 2006, um, uh, the Outlaws with Castro did this song. Um, did a song with Echo Fresh, and that song went platinum in Sweden with Echo Fresh. It was German, English. Echo Fresh and uh, Outlaws. The song is called Ich bin ein Outlaw. I am an outlaw. The hook is crazy. It's really nice. It doesn't matter what language you hear it in. It's a nice hook, and that's what sold the song. Right? Rebellion, I'm an outlaw. Um, and then at the same time, uh, Novo sold Echo Fresh. Um, the feature was Tupac for Bad Boys. I'm a bad boy, bad boys, you know. Um, and he had no right to do that. No, because that's a 94 recording. That's two years before Noble even showed up. It doesn't matter when it was. He ain't got the right to sell anything, Tupac. He Fair shouldn't enough. be selling no pictures. He shouldn't be selling nothing. nothing. Oh, ugly ass. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I digress. <laughs> so so basically what what you're saying is this is kind of a formula that that he uses it's kind of like a bust out go get the airfare get paid for shows sh on everybody and leave it's mo yep yep it's um he's 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 um he's treacherous at it now here's the thing it's been what like a month or so since i did uh the 313 um, and Noble hasn't lashed out at all. You know why? Because like I said, I got all the emails, baby. All of them. Every last email. And guess what? I got pictures with them ugly ass bitches too. Okay? <laughs> so you got the receipts and that's why you think he won't call you out on it. Look, he could call me out. I'm going to come see you, Noble. <laughs> I'm going to come see you, man. It would probably be Valentine's Day, you know, you know, since we love each other so much, it'll be Valentine's Day, um, you know, give you that little heart, you know, but um, uh, he's not calling me out because he thought 
all of these years, I didn't say anything because I didn't keep receipts. Joe, I keep everything. Okay, I keep receipts on everything. I take pictures. You want to sit up there and screw me over? Come on, man. I brought you back to life. Me and my wife uh, performed CPR on these dudes, man. You know, gave them a heartbeat again, you know, and they screwed us over really bad. And I was talking to a dude in the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, sorry, who they screwed over real bad. Dude had him in a hotel for six days. Had prostitutes for them, paid for tattoos for them, had 24-hour limo service for them, paid their food. Again, the contract for booking was three days. He did six days. And these dudes, no were going to up and bounce. He even paid for clothes for them. They did, did two songs with two different groups. Um, uh, the day that they were leaving, they just up and bounced, left over 2,000 euro worth of um, um uh, mini bar and telephone, 2,000 euro worth, that's a lot of money, uh, bounced. And so the dude called him up, a dude named Moses Malone. Moses called him up and Moses said, hey man, what are you doing? You know, you left the hotel, what's going on? He said, you know, you kept me waiting. So fuck you. That's some real nigga shit. So, <laughs> so the dude, Moses is an African dude from Uganda, right? You don't really want to fuck with dudes from Uganda, man. They'll cut you. They will cut you, man. <laughs> the dude will chuck. They always they got a machete and they suck. You know? <laughs> put, yeah. You can pull out a machete right out of their high top sneakers, man. It'll be like four feet long. These dudes you don't want to play with. <laughs> so Nova was talking shit on the way to the hotel uh, to the airport to go to Sweden. Um no to um uh Ron, Ron Stock or yeah, somewhere over there. So um, <laughs> to the Netherlands. <laughs> so the dude calls me up. He said, what am I supposed to do? I said, what do you want me to do? You know, you know, you don't pay for that show. I told you, don't buy the dude in the weed. Don't smoke with these. Of them. Don't do any of this shit. Just do your, your three days and let them bounce. They can't stay there. They got to pay for it themselves. All right. Um, <laughs> so... Because he was supposed to go to a show in Hamburg, come to one of the shows that he asked me to put together for him, which nobody bought tickets for. I think it was like six people in, in Hanover. Um, so anyway, the police stops them in, um, at the airport and um, tells them, okay, look, you can't leave here until you pay this bill. So between Edie and Noble, their wives, they had to stay another night, their wives had to wire money through their credit cards to pay for these wet bar and telephone bills. The wet bar being the mini bar, you know, the, you know, your little refrigerator. 2,000 euro worth? God, That's crazy. Damn. Yeah. So <laughs> the next day, Dick Ray fly out. Um, you know, first of all, before his wives paid for the bill, Noble was going to tell them to call me and have my management pay for it. Now, you already told everybody on the internet, I'm no longer your manager, but now you want me to pay this bill. <laughs> it's crazy. So the next day, they get into the hotel, get to the airport, and they stop storming. Cocaine. Yes, yes, it's the arrest with the cocaine. Now, yeah. a okay. lot of people have said that wasn't Stormy's. No, it wasn't Stormy. It was, it was um, uh, Nobles, man. Because I'm going to tell you, that dude Stormy, a legit dude, man, really cool guy. I had a couple of conversations with him. He had said to me, this was on a slide. He was like, I came into the room with him and, and uh, Edie. He was like, yeah, man, it's all I need. I said, you guys are doing good? Everything good? You know, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, man, that's all. I, he 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 kind of sitting on the edge of this post, um, on the on the balcony, right? And he's got this joint. The sun's going down. He's feeling good. He's he's in another country. He's relaxed. He's got a cognac glass, you know, with Hennessy in one hand. He's got a a, a joint, you know, a, a white boy in his other hand, right? And he's he's like this. I guess he's just feeling the 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 oddness of this situation, this moment. And he said, all I need is my Henny and my weed. He said, that's all I need, man. I'm good. 
You know, he's just feeling it, you know. But he was also telling me something. Gotcha. That I had already figured out. I met dude in the hallway, you know, with the crap. So he was also telling me something without saying anything. Um, but when, by him saying that, I knew that that coat was not his in that suitcase. I knew that Noble set his ass up. He can't, look, he can't do that with the video dude, right? Pay attention. He can't do that with James Wade because James Wade is doing music video shoots for him and all these different people. He, every uh, country he's going to, you know, that's money, money, that's cash money. So he can't put it in his, he can't put it in Edie's because Edie is a legit outlaw. So let me put it in Mr. Green. All right, Stormy, he green to all of this shit, you know. He green, you know. He, he a new fish to this whole thing. They put it in his bag. And so. He ended up doing, like, quite a bit of time over that, he? Didn't did. He? Oh, he did well over six months. He did well over six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could never come back to that, to that. He may, I don't know if, it, if that's all of Europe or not. But his he he's limited in what countries you can go to in Europe now for sure, and that's oh, also, this dude is very talented. He is super talented, in, in my opinion. In my opinion, that dude he could. He's just as far as I'm concerned. If if he if he just changed over to a little bit more popish, like a Big Sean, that's where he would be. That's where he would be at, man. He would be at the Big Sean or or, or higher status. That's that's my opinion of that too. That dude. He might not have a high opinion of me, but <laughs> I got one of him. Well, you've you've given us a, a wealth of information on these guys. In, in closing, what would you say to the fans of the Outlaws? Do you have a message for the fans of the Outlaws? Would you would you tell them be wary, or would you would you say you know it, it's all good with these guys? I just have a personal beef. I, I, I would have to say that um, the outlaws are a tragedy. That's that's about as, that's the best way I could put it. Is a is a tragedy. Um, after finding out uh, what Tupac's intentions were, because he always had good intentions uh, for every project. And every person that he wanted to work with, from what I understand, from what I understand, um, and his intentions with these these young men that he brought on board um, were good intentions. You know, it was an outlet for him, actually a creative outlet for him. Um, but there are a they are a poetic tragedy when you look at it. Um, a guy noble who really isn't noble, and I'm being honest. I've I've a lot of people. I ain't gonna show you, but I ain't never fuck nobody. That ain't have it coming. You fuck me, I'm gonna fuck you back. And I'm being honest with that. But I in no way, shape, or form fuck these dudes. Not in one iota. Not 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 even the tiniest bit. Um, the outlaws for years, for the last at least 10, 12 years, have been ran by a guy who was never officially endorsed by Tupac, um, who's never reached the heights of Tupac, who uh, I have it on good information that he wants to be Tupac. He wants that, you know, he wants the, 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 the highlights of it, but he could never get it on his own because he was never meant to be a rapper. Okay. Um, and I would say, honestly, stop entertaining a false image of what Tupac was trying to put out. It's a false image. It's, it's, it's fake. It's, a, it's phony. Um, I'm not saying you got to go to jail to be a uh, to be an outlaw. Um, a soldier doesn't have to. Um, go to war to be a veteran, okay? But there is a difference. There's a war veteran, and then there is a peacetime veteran, okay? There's a, uh, a a street thug, and then there's a a, a career um, criminal, 
No way, neither one. He's a bum making money off of Tupac's name. And when he threatened, in the letter, he threatened me and my wife with two Tupac fans to come to my house and hurt us, physically hurt us with his with Tupac's fans. Oh, I guess you never read that letter. No, I haven't. Oh, Terrell has it. <laughs> he put he put it out there on Facebook. He wrote us a letter threatening us with Tupac's fans if we didn't leave him alone. That he he'd send people to you. Yes, he he wrote it in my, to my house. This is what he wrote. Yes. <laughs> I mean, this, this guy assumed authority. And I actually thought about it, that he had influence over, we're talking about millions of fans that just one of them crazy enough would pop up in my house and shoot up my damn house with my kids and my wife based on this guy telling his lies. Just so they could say, I rode for the outlaws. I, exactly. You know, so I take it very serious, his threat. I took it very, very, I still take it to today. I take it very, very serious. And that's why I'm still very angry about it, not including the damn near $70,000 that we had to pay back uh, for the bullshit that he caused. You know, um, none of the money that we ever made on any of the features um, in the music videos that we set up. Um, and that's part of it in this email that he wrote. It's coming from his email address. He threatened the life and the well-being of me and my wife and my children okay with using the tupac fans as soldiers he writes it as soldiers to follow his orders he writes that man <laughs> all for trying to make him some money yeah 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 a couple of couple you know it was probably about 20 30,000 that he made you know doing these videos and uh, features you know but I take it very serious how presumptuous of him to think that the, did you, how, you know how arrogant, but not just arrogant, but how confident you must feel to make such a threat using somebody else's fans. They're not Rufus Cooper fans. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> They're not Rufus Cooper fans. They're not Young Noble fans. They're Tupac fans. And he wrote in, in the letter that hey, I'm going to send my people over there. We got soldiers all over the world that would love to come and take care of you and your wife, blah, blah, blah. You can read the letter yourself. You know, it's out there for the public to see it. Is there any recourse on your end? Is there any is there any way for you to get your your losses back from this guy or is it a complete wash? Well, I think it would call on a moral end. Sure, I could, you know, have lawyers in the states when, once we return next year, um, follow suit because we have a legitimate contract. Um, follow suit, um, but we could never get the money. And uh, you know, <laughs> he's just like any other atypical drug addict. Okay, we could never get back whatever we're going to pay uh, the attorneys. We could never get that back. You can say, oh, you won on a moral and ethical end. You know, I don't give a shit about winning on a moral, ethical end when it comes to my finances and feeding my family. You know, um, I don't care about that. You know, it, it doesn't help me say, oh, I, I I fought the good fight. You know, I've been to war. Screw that. Okay, nobody <laughs> fight the good fight and you lose a leg. You know, no, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not with that. So basically, um, if you took him to court, you would base you would just sue him for a judgment that they he, they would bankrupt on. Exactly. Just like all of if you go if you look all of the companies, the One Nation, the One Nation Music, Doug, uh, Outlaws Entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, they have closed all of those businesses since 2015. All of those businesses that they had, all those record labels, clothing brands, blah, 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 all that's been closed. Okay. Why they closed it? Because um, Afeni realized that Noble and Edie was hustling her. And Castro bounced back because he realized that they were hustling him. So um, 
only money that they're getting now is uh, telling lies on Fox uh, uh, document specials and um, uh, he might get some some money from me in a civil suit. I, I beat the f out of him. Because, <laughs> um, I, he. I didn't expect that. That was hilarious. Well, I'm, I'm gonna meet him in the street one day. I'm gonna meet him in the street one day, and James Wade ain't gonna have a video camera on him. You know, um, you can go through life, uh, Jess. You can go through life and 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 deal with people's bullshit and swallow it and swallow it and swallow it. Then that one dude comes along. Who's been screwing over people for years? Now he done screwed you over. That one dude who really cared and tried to do the best that he could do for him, and now he done screwed you over. Your wife is looking at you, Jess, like, "What the f did you get us into?" Your kids are looking at us like, "Damn, Daddy, is that what they what that that that's, that's the outlaws, you know, from Tupac, you know, Tupac, Daddy Machiavelli? He, they talk, he's talking real bad about you, Daddy, that you stole money from him, Daddy." Got it coming. Yeah.